<clears throat> well, like all of you, I was um, very impressed with all of the presentations we had yesterday. I particularly want to thank um, Deborah and Victoria and Arno. Um, I flew in from the Midwestern United States yesterday, and I can attest to everything they said about circadian rhythms. Um, <clears throat> my interest in architecture, my interest in daylighting, has to do with how architects' knowledge of light, of daylight, helps to generate architectural space and how architectural space generates form. And in a reciprocal way, how architectural form and space influence the character and quality of daylight. So the, um, the things I look at are, of course, um, building orientation. I'm interested in how circulation and light come together, how they work together. I'm interested in structure and light. I'm interested in how architects choose materials and decide how they're assembled with reference to light and shade and shadow and dim light and darkness. That is to say, as an architect, I'm interested in how you know where to put a hole in a wall. So the problem I've been thinking about recently is the problem of low angle sun. And the, um, a couple I have a couple examples for you. The one I want to particularly speak about is Gunnar Asplund's um, well-known, highly respected Stockholm Public Library. And the problem he faced here, and the problem faced by architects in Scandinavia, the Nordic countries, high latitudes, is the problem of low angle sun because it always presents the problem of glare. Putting an opening, a window, in a vertical, vertical surface always makes you vulnerable to direct sunlight, to glare, and to overheating in buildings. <clears throat> um, this was brought to mind recently <clears throat> by uh, some visits to Toronto. My wife's family lives in Toronto. We're fairly close, so we, we go there fairly often to visit. And this is Toronto City Hall by Viljo Ravel. Ravel was an architect from Finland, from Vaza, um, a part of, Finland, uh, part of Finland which is known for a fairly flat landscape, for low sun angles, and for tall buildings. And when he won the competition to design this Toronto City Hall in the late 1950s, that is, not surprisingly, exactly what he did. What interests me, as I looked at this a couple of years ago, was how the outside of these rings of, uh, of these buildings are completely opaque. That is to say, they do not permit any low angle sun, no east and west sun, direct sun to enter whatsoever, nor very much direct uh, um, light from the northern sky to keep those cold winds off. All of the sun comes from basically the southern part of the sky. It's pretty clear what he was doing, I think. Um, and of course, those windows are unprotected entirely. So it seems to me this is sort of a binary situation in which either you get all light or nothing. There's no attempt, I think, as much as the building is sort of an iconic thing, and it's, you, know, you can see this building or a, a representation, a drawing of it on, the, uh, on signs around Toronto, sort of the, the emblem of the city. <clears throat> but there's no attempt in the building to balance light, to try to balance how light comes across space, taking, bringing in light from the east and west, morning and evening, afternoon, and balancing it with that um, light from the south. I think there are other interesting examples. Of course, Toronto City Hall, um, like this uh, Social Security Administration building by Sigurd Leverance, a 1920s building in Stockholm, is an atrium type of building. <clears throat> we talked about, a little bit about atriums yesterday, how useful they are. But at least in this building, Leverance at least provides the potential for light to be gathered from the outside of the building as well as the inside, so light can be balanced across space. Now, if you look at the plans, you'll see that those individual windows on the outside usually open to uh, separate offices. It's not as if you can, it's not if the space is moved directly across from the atrium to the exterior of the building all the time, but the potential is there. He's recognizing that, and of course the atrium is used to modify, to filter the light to a certain extent. <clears throat> There's the interior of the building and the exterior. So we come to Stockholm uh, Public Library um, <clears throat> by, Lever by uh, Asplund. Um, he started in another place altogether. At first, he decided he was going to top that lending room 
with a dome. The dome was going to be a coffered dome, somewhat like the Pantheon, except instead of concrete, he was going to glaze the coffers. And he ran into a problem. Now, most people who've written about this building, not everyone, but most people who've written about it said that he abandoned the dome and went to a flat-ceilinged, flat-roofed drum because of structural and economic concerns. And that, there's probably some truth in that. You can all see that it would have been cheaper to, to just top off the building with a, uh, with a flat roof. But that's not what Asplund said he did. He wrote a very straightforward um, article about the building in 1927, about the time the building was finished, and here's what he said, only in Swedish, of course. Um, he said that the only kind of glass he could get for those coffers would have been a matte finish, that it would have been dull and gray. In fact, my understanding is that the word he used in Swedish implies sad. Now, he had some experience with this. Some of you, the architects in the audience, will recognize this building. It's the interior of Asplund's earlier building, the Woodland Chapel. It's in the Woodland Cemetery south of Stockholm. It's a sensational little room, a very highly respected little building. You can see how the dome is inserted under a gabled roof. <clears throat> if you go there, the light in this room is incredible. But it's highly subdued. It's very diffused. That's because you've, the building sits under a, um, under a fairly diffused, um, sometimes overcast sky. The pine trees overwhelm the building. There's a skylight. There's a skylight well which bounces the light around and diffuses it. Then it enters through an oculus at the top of the visible dome, which is translucent. Then that light is reflected and re-reflected and re-reflected within the dome. And the base of the, um, the, base of the, um, of the room is actually gray. So the light is clearly daylight. It has the quality of daylight, but it's absolutely still. It's as if time had stopped. It's as if life were suspended. It really took my breath away when I visited. Now, this might be the kind of daylight that would be appropriate for a chapel, a cemetery chapel, but perhaps not for a library. In a library, you want something vivid, enervating. So he tried the dome, but the problem with the dome, the part they didn't mention would be, if he had all that glass, if it had been clear, you would have an enormous amount of direct sunlight on the bookshelves, on the floor, on people, such that the books would have been vulnerable and the people would have been uncomfortable. So he does this, so he raises the drum up and he tops it with, a, with essentially a flat ceiling. And what he gets is this. He still has his room surrounded by books, a wonderful feeling. But then he has at least half of that dome, which is a white, undulating, rough, painted plaster. And that's what's really happening here. He's taking that low-angle sun, he's bringing it in above your head so it's not in your eyes, at least most of the time. He's using that extra volume, that extra surface, to bounce that light around, to distribute the daylight, the skylight, the sun when he gets it in that room. You can read you can read the time of day. You still have this connection with the outside. But again, in what he trades is an enormous area of glass for an enormous area of diffusing surface. And that's what really makes the building work. So you go into this room, and it's lovely. What could be better than being surrounded by books? You can also see here <clears throat> that the lighting in this room is really about the combination of daylight and electric light, right? Because you can see that bright ring above the bookshelves and it combines the light. But what the uh, electric light does here is something interesting too. You can see it provides a little sort of up light on those undulations in the plaster. And so it seems like these are clouds floating in a sky. Um, and um, Asplund, in fact, played around a lot with using the, the ceiling as a sky in his buildings. You could say that about the little chapel I showed you, about other buildings he did before and after this. The history of architecture is in part a history of making holes in, 
in buildings. After we make a building and cut out almost all the light, we have to find a way of getting that light back in. And dealing with the ceiling as a sky is a long tradition. It's an old and noble tradition. In one in which we used to work in metaphor or allegory, but now we have something else at hand. And this is what Aspen was trying to do. His model for how to bring in light, how to deal with the sky, was to use the local sky, the Stockholm sky, Nordic light, as his model. So how does this work? My interest here is in how light brings meaning to architecture. And what is happening? Well, there are two things, or three things happening here. One is that the books are protected in this room and they're protected from light. At the same time, they're exposed to light. We have a saying in, in English, of course, we associate the word enlightenment with knowledge, with the acquisition of knowledge, with revelation. And of course, that's entirely appropriate in a library. This building was the first open shelf lending library in, in Sweden. And so the idea of protecting people, of protecting the books, bringing people and knowledge to light works perfectly. I'd like to end with one, with one comment, well, two comments. First of all, that what I have found in looking at light and architecture is that I am interested in how buildings work, not just how they're packaged. And what we're seeing in a building like this is a daylighting strategy, which is not about technique. You don't throw a switch. It doesn't use nanomaterials. The light gathering, receiving, filtering device in this building is inhabitable space, the space in which we live. Finally, with this in mind, I'd like to quote or paraphrase the, um, the poet John Chiardi who said that the performance, or he would have said, the performance of architecture is in its meaning of itself. Thank you very much.